This was a log when I started my first shop, my daily reminder of 1968. This was my budget. The grand total was $3,000. Equipment, $325. Advertising, $750. Initial rent, home and shop, $375. I was able to convince my first wife, my father-in-law, opening a tattoo shop was a, a business that could work, you know, in, this, in those days. <laughs> yeah, Thursday, April 4th. 2250 the first day. Man, I'm off and running. I'll never forget. So there was a dummy rail thing that they had to pass under. There was no body table set up. And this guy came in. I think he was junked out or something. He's trying to tattoo this bird on his belly and he's doing the swoon. I thought, oh gee, this might be harder than I thought. From when I was a little kid, I was obsessed with tattooing. It just seemed like the coolest thing there was. And at the point when I graduated art school, I reconnected with it and thought, yeah, this has just got all kinds of potential. I tattooed for 40 years and uh, retired from putting on tattoos about uh, eight or 10 years ago and back to my personal art. And the, and the Ed Hardy brand, I bet some people don't even know that's like tattooing. No, no. And then for a lot of people in tattooing, it was like, oh my God, you know, I can't believe he did this. Yeah, the sellout. Like that asshole, you know? <laughs> Wasn't he happy enough that he... <laughs> I know. When Ed decided to find the contract to license out whatever number of designs he did way back when, no one would ever have dreamed this would happen. And he had a great name, Ed Hardy, which sounds so American. All of a sudden, Buster Rhymes had an Ed Hardy shirt and hat, and the Madonna was seen in it. So it blew up. It financially afforded him a situation where he could focus on painting, and that's been great for him. I got really annoyed when people started putting down Ed Hardy, but all they knew him was as some designs on sneakers or t-shirts, you know? No, there's an actual real thinking artist continuing to grow artists behind that brand name you know as Ed Hardy. I had a lot of people give me a lot of shit about that. Well, what are you doing, man, putting your stuff on these t-shirts? How do you feel about that? I said, I feel pretty good. I bought this building. <laughs> One of the things that's fascinating to me about Ed and his family, his mom particularly, is that she kept everything and that's become a family tradition. <laughs> he meticulously records everything and he's always got a journal on him, he's always writing all of this stuff down and he keeps a record of all this stuff and it's really incredible. Super conscious about my legacy and everything and I'm old now and I don't know how long you know, I'll be around to kick this stuff over so I don't want to piece it out, I want it to go someplace. This was just a big ego rub for me. I wanted to just showcase all my art. I just thought, well, it's been a really interesting life, all this stuff happening, and because I've saved it all, you know, it'd be nice to chronicle it. Art never seems to make me peaceful or pure. I always seem to be wrapped in the melodrama of vulgarity. My first shop in Vancouver, down an area, there's Sailor Jerry. This guy, Hong Kong Tom, that had the lead chair at Burt Grimm's, I knew he'd work with Jerry, and I kept saying, but I want to know more about Jerry. And he'd go, ah, he's a trip, he's a trip. And one night, we were hanging out with Tom, we were smoking weed, and, uh, and we went over to his apartment, and he broke open his footlocker, you know, the tattoo, we always kept all our stuff in trunks. And he came out with these color photos of Jerry's work, which included, like, these cranes. No one was doing tattoos like that. It was the color, the imagery, the beauty of it, the sort of mastery of the drawing. And, it, and I just remember looking at him, and I went, oh, well, so, f so this is why Sailor Jerry's like everybody talks about him. And he went, yeah, he's a trip. And then this jumps to when I was working in San Diego. And I was, I was really promoting the idea of doing big, unique tattoos. And we were probably clocking. We might have been making maybe $20 an hour or $25. But been, you know, I was working for Doc Webb. That's where I got my chops up tattooing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of servicemen down there. This book, it was the first real book about Japanese tattooing. This book was the first revelation because it was all these classic Tokyo tattooers that were really doing stuff right out of the woodblock prints, 19th century style. The first time I went in Phil Sparrow's, 
He said, oh, you're an art student. He said, look at this, this is real art. This book just came out about Japanese tattoos. And when I saw those pictures, basically I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And it was just like thunder in the room, you know, it was so incredibly powerful. The key connection was Kazuo Oguri, Horihide in Gifu City. Oguri came over from Japan and we all stayed at Jerry's house just over a three-day period. And then when I saw this hand work firsthand, it was just like 3,000 years on the head of a pin. You know, you just, we'd never seen anything like that. It was so, it was cosmic. And right away I thought, getting a souvenir. I said, would you do my back? And I was fixated on this one image from a Kuniyoshi print. It was just amazing. And he said I could come and work with him. So that's it, man. Ed had a very strong focus on Japanese tattooing. He helped introduce that style to the United States. There's only been a few non-Asian artists that have perfected the Japanese style to where they can take that stuff and make it their own. Did you bring it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to get a shot yeah. of it? Yeah, what the hell? Okay. One of my favorite pieces by Ed Hardy, actually, he is a tomomori. I mean, he put in so many of these elements, and uh, but he just got such an angst in that face. Like, I think definitely with the Japanese stuff, like, he took that simplicity, the boldness, like, the toughness of American tattooing, and he made it so raw. That, to me, is just raw Ed power. My Japanese art signature, which was Hori Ona, so that's what I was using when I was first, when I went over to Japan and other things, so. I came back from Japan dead broke. So I tattooed in San Diego and built up a little bankroll. And then I opened Realistic in 1974. I was 29 when I opened that up. People challenged me, you know, I, I would, never would have had the interest or smartness to do this style of thing as a tattoo, but by opening it up to people that wanted something very different, it uh, opened me up. When he and my stepmother Francesca decided that yes, we should move back to San Francisco and he was gonna open a custom only shop, I knew it was really different. It turned out that that was the first custom only tattoo shop in America, period. Before the 70s, when I started getting tattoos, if you wanted to get a custom design, they were just like, no, you're not, you can't get that. He was way ahead of the game with that private studio business. When you walked into that place, you know, you felt like you're somewhere. Once people started realizing they could get their dream tattooed on them, you know, a lot of people were doing it, man. Not because they thought it was cool, it's because they just plain wanted it. He created a situation where everybody had to step up their game and step up to this idea of custom tattooing, and it changed everything. All of a sudden, it was seeing him doing these sometimes small, sometimes really big, just elaborate pieces that no one had ever seen before. I mean, I said it was like going to Denny's or something. Well, what's for dinner? Six things. And so I thought, this is stupid. You're going to wear it forever, and you got to pick off the wall. I mean, I love the old flash, but my whole mission with this is if I can just open it up and let people encourage them to come in and tell me their ideas, it'll change this thing around. One of my favorite metaphors is a police sketch artist. You describe the person that broke into your house, and the guy looked like this, and he did this. And that's how I would try to pull the imagery out of people that I was supposed to draw. And I loved it when people go, that's exactly how I imagined. Bitchin', let's, okay, good, we'll do that, you know? I knew that San Francisco would be the place that I could make it work because there was enough alternative consciousness. This city is famous, rightfully so, for people doing things a bit differently. San Francisco has been a magnet for rebels a long time. I think you come here and you just feel like you can do anything.